In these agreements, and he, this is a quote from Barry Appleton, a trade lawyer, and he sums it up very succinctly. In these agreements, and he's talking about the FTA and then NAFTA and now the SPP. In these agreements, negotiators created an anti-government, anti-conservation, deregulated continental energy policy based on short-term, high-cost, high-profit exports, controlled by transnational energy corporations with little concern for rising prices or the environmental consequences of their action. So now you see why I've promised you some rays for optimism down the road. Um, and it, it, is, you know, it is very clear that the agenda that's been played out in first the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, then NAFTA, and which would be entrenched in the deep integration agenda, are about the, the giving away of our raw energy resources. Why does the U.S. want our energy? First, of course, everybody knows they consume more than they're producing. They have an energy strategy that does not focus on reducing consumption, but focuses on increasing and securing supply for the future. And Alberta's tar sands feature quite prominently. The U.S. has also made energy, and I know that Steve touched on this, part of their security agreement. Their national security and their energy security are one and the same. And I want to take a step back for a second, because when I talk about this frequently, uh, some of my critics say, but the U.S. is our friend. We should be nice to our friend. We should, you know, we should, be, we should be generous with our friend. Um, and especially because we didn't go to war with them, so we owe them something. We've got to be even nicer to them. And this profoundly misses the incredible power imbalance between the Canada and the United States. And it's like the bully in the playground. You might be friends with the bully, but you're always a little bit scared. And are you giving the bully something because you're scared or because you want to? So um, Canada has very much got this mentality of, of um, a need to have you know, the U.S. be our friend. And in this context, we have given them our energy resources. As I mentioned, Canada is already part of a continental market with, with NAFTA and the Free Trade Agreement. Um, this integration has had a serious impact on reducing our sovereignty over our energy resources and our security of future energy supplies. It's also entrenched a colonial relationship in terms of us being a resource hinterland, initially with the United Kingdom, and we've now switched that to the United States, and we are a resource base for them. Um, now, I want to refer back to John's sort of corporate coup d'etat, um, and, uh, and I think it's a bit more um, insidious than that. It's kind of colonization by stealth, and the, and the Australians have a great term for it. They call it white anting, because they have these white ants that sort of crawl up into the middle of something and hollow it out from the inside. Um, and so I think that in a lot of ways that's what's been done with our energy sovereignty and security. With NAFTA, first, national treatment rules were eliminated, whereby Canadian companies could no longer be treated preferentially over foreign corporations. So that opened up our energy sector to foreign corporations. Second, preferential pricing was prohibited, whereby Canada could no longer set an internal price for energy that was different from our export price. Third, export regulations were eliminated, such as export taxes, impact assessment requirements for export licenses, and our 25-year vital supply safeguard, which previously meant oil or gas could not be exported if we did not have 25 years for Canadian security. And finally, the proportional sharing clause was introduced, whereby Canada has to maintain a guaranteed level export to the United States. So what's this meant? First, natural gas prices skyrocketed because we used to... Canadian gas, we used to set the price in Canada, and now that price is set in the United States. So we lost sovereign control over our pricing, which has had huge impacts across manufacturing. And I know that um, that was referred to earlier by Hassan in terms of hundreds of thousands of jobs that are being lost because we no longer have any control over energy price impacts. Currency is another problem. Um, so pricing has caused 
a deindustrialization, especially in sectors like the petrochemicals that rely on natural gas, not just for energy, but as a feedstock. So we're losing our value-added industries and we're losing our manufacturing. Second, foreign ownership skyrocketed. No other major industrialized country has the level of foreign ownership that Canada has, especially not of their energy sector. Altogether, some 36 different sectors of our economy are now majority foreign owned. And we've seen the intolerance in the United States for foreign ownership because when China tried to buy Unical, an energy company in the States, Congress stepped in and prevented the takeover bid and actually forced Unical to accept a lower price bid from an American company. So the, 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 the United States would never accept the level of foreign ownership we have, especially of their energy sector. Um, as for the, another impact from the NAFTA changes is that production levels have skyrocketed. Um, we are now exporting more than half of our oil and gas, which we weren't prior to um, NAFTA and the FTA. Production has increased dramatically, almost four times for natural gas and almost six times for oil. Now this is going to go even higher because we're projecting a growth from 1 million barrels a day to 5 million barrels a day out of the tar sands. And the majority of that will be for export to the, to the United States. Um, and so these dramatic increases in export levels have meant that our conventional oil and gas reserves are falling. Gas peaked in 2001 and is now on the decline. Oil peaked before that. Conventional oil peaked before that. So now we know that we have about 8.9 years left in reserve of natural gas. And that's quickly falling because we're producing more per year than we're finding. We're still exporting 56% to the United States. Because conventional oil and gas are declining, we are forced now to shift to non-conventional sources like the tar sands, Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, uh, coal bed methane, and offshore oil and gas. All of these have much, much higher environmental risk associated with them than conventional oil and gas. And not enough debate has been had publicly around the implications of shifting to these higher environmental cost resources. Um, the fastest growing area of climate change emissions is in the energy extraction sector. And as tar sands increases capacity, they're one of the worst offenders. They're in the top polluters in the country. Um, so those issues are issues that we need to debate as we see the level of exports ramp up further under deep integration with the United States. Um, another area that's been impacted by the deregulation is royalties and taxes. They're at an all-time low. Um, we are now the lowest in the world uh, at 23 cents a barrel for oil, which, uh, you know, given that they're not making quite enough money these days, maybe it's reasonable. <laughs> they were leading uh, the, the nation in record profit levels this year and last year, the energy sector. So there's certainly room for change in there. This is where we get to the optimism. There's room for change in terms of, of the level of investment that we have in Canada. Um, Canada is very strategically located globally in energy resources. First, the majority of energy in the world, almost 80%, is owned publicly and extracted publicly. So private corporations cannot even get at more than 20% of the world's oil. So Canada is in that 20%, which is a very strategic place to be. Second, the rest of the oil around the world is becoming higher and higher cost to find. There's less and less of it. And it's higher and higher risk because the, the exploration costs are so much higher. Alberta's tar sands, we know where it is. There's no risk in exploration and development. So a second major strategic factor. And third, there's a large investment push of dollars coming from the United States real estate crash looking for a place to park. Returns in the tar sands and in the energy sector right now are 15 to 22 percent. So there is room for Canada to hold those negotiating cards. We are actually very strategic and we have a lot of power in the global energy economy. We need to exercise that. We need to have an energy security strategy that balances federal and provincial interests, consuming and non-consuming province interests, prioritizes Canadian value-added jobs and Canadian interests first.